Our ancient ancestors unknowingly left behind objects and artifacts that fascinate us. If only they'd left behind notes with the objects to guide us in our quest to understand them. Nevertheless, we embark on this journey of discovery, uncovering remarkable finds, and piecing together their stories. The past remains an enigma, but let's strive to understand it together. In the early 19th century, British nobles indulged in a trend that added an element of allure to their romantic affairs. Lover's eyes, also known as eye miniatures. These unique jewelry pieces gained popularity during the Georgian era and involved depicting only the eyes of one's beloved. While personal portraits had been common adornments for centuries, the focus solely on the eyes was a novelty. This trend emerged around the time of the French Revolution, but gained significant popularity in Britain largely due to the influence of the Prince of Wales, later George IV. He was known for his numerous love interests and had his most notorious affair with Maria Fitzherbert. Despite legal and societal constraints, George showered Maria with affection, including a commissioned portrait of his eye painted by Richard Cosway, which he sent along with a marriage proposal. Their forbidden union was short-lived as George III intervened and forced the prince to marry a German princess. However, the Prince of Wales had unwittingly sparked a fashion for lovers' eyes. These intimate pieces fostered a tactile connection between the wearer and the depicted subject, creating a sense of emotional closeness. Today, only around a thousand lovers' eyes from the 1780s to the 1830s survive. In May 2023, the Reek Museum acquired a rare and exquisite gold ruby red glass drinking cup crafted by Johann Kunkel, a prominent 17th century German alchemist, apothecary, and glassmaker. Dating back to around 1685, the cup showcases Kunkel's pioneering technique of adding gold to glass to achieve a deep, intense red color. Only about 20 of Kunkel's early gold ruby red glass pieces are known making this shell-shaped calyx cup with its unique shape, style, and engraved scene of playful putty frolicking around vines a truly exceptional find. The cup's engraving is attributed to Gottfried Spiller, a master glass engraver known for his work on gold ruby glasses. The glass itself resembles cut stone rather than blown glass, fitting within the tradition of Kutzkammer collections that brought together extraordinary objects from nature, science, and art. The discovery that gold compounds could produce shades of red and glass was known in antiquity, but it was Kunkel who refined the process and published his own treatise on glass production. He perfected the recipe for gold ruby glass, which gained immense popularity and was considered a precious material with purported health benefits. This Moai statue, originally erected in Orongo on Easter Island, now stands as a solitary figure in London. Its exact age is uncertain, but like all of its brethren, it's believed to have been made in between 1000 and 1600. Named Hoa Hakananaya by the island's natives, meaning lost or stolen friend, it holds significance due to its theft by British explorers in 1868. Carved from basalt, the statue follows the typical design of Easter Island Moai, featuring distinct facial features such as a prominent nose, brow, chin, nipples, and elongated ears. Its hands rest on a protruding stomach, while petroglyphs added later adorn its body, including depictions of birdmen, a sooty tern called Manatara, and ceremonial paddles. There are further carvings that are yet to be positively identified. After its journey to England, the Moai was donated by Queen Victoria to the British Museum in 1869, where it remains on display. However, the Chilean government asserts ownership of the statue, while some indigenous groups from Rapa Nui have advocated for its return to the island. The British government opposes this proposal, citing the lack of a conservation plan for the Moai on Easter Island. In May 2023, archaeologists in Israel confirmed that they'd uncovered a 2,000-year-old financial record on the pilgrimage road in the city of David, Jerusalem, shedding light on the commercial activities of the Second Temple period. 
The Israel Antiquities Authority revealed that the small stone tablet likely served as a receipt or payment instruction, providing valuable insight into the daily lives of the city's inhabitants. The inscription features partially preserved lines with Hebrew names, letters, and numbers. One line ends with the name Shema, followed by the Hebrew letter Mem, while other lines include symbols representing numbers, some accompanied by the letters Mem or Resh, abbreviations for money and quarters, respectively. Similar inscriptions have been found in Jerusalem and Bet Shemesh, but this is the first one discovered within the boundaries of ancient Jerusalem during that period. The tablet was carved onto a chalk stone slab, which was likely originally used as an ossuary, suggesting the possibility of local trading or craftsmanship. The pilgrimage road, as its name suggests, served a crucial route for both pilgrims and commercial activities, emphasizing the importance of this discovery and understanding the historical narrative of Jerusalem. The wooden sculpture known as the Mangareva statue or deity figure originates from the island of Mangareva in French Polynesia. Created in the late 18th or early 19th century, this male god figure was handed over to English missionaries as the local population embraced Christianity. Eventually, the British Museum acquired the sculpture in 1911. During the early 19th century, European explorers and missionaries arrived in Mangareva, introducing new religious beliefs to the islanders. In 1835, French missionaries, with the support of the local king and former high priest, destroyed much of the indigenous artwork, but spared this idol. The London Missionary Society likely obtained the statue in the 1820s and later loaned it to the British Museum before selling it to the National Collection. The Mangareva statue is carved from polished wood native to the region and remains mostly intact, missing only parts of its arms and feet. The figure represents a standing male deity displaying distinct features unique to Mangarevan art. While its precise meaning and name are uncertain, scholars suggest it may represent either the agricultural god Rongo or the principal god of Mangareva, too. The Gwegel Shield is a fascinating artifact that holds immense cultural and historic significance in Australia. Crafted by the indigenous Gwegel people, the shield is a remarkable example of their rich artistic and technological traditions. Carved from wood, the shield features intricate engravings and decorative motifs that reflect the unique cultural identity of the Guego community. One of the most famous aspects of the Guego shield is its connection to Captain James Cook's arrival in Botany Bay in 1770. It's believed that an aboriginal warrior named Kuman used this shield during a confrontation with Cook and his crew. This encounter marked the first significant interaction between indigenous Australians and European explorers, making the Guego Shield a powerful symbol of resistance and resilience. Currently housed in the British Museum in London, the Guego Shield serves as a tangible reminder of Australia's colonial history and the ongoing relationship between indigenous communities and their cultural heritage. Its presence in the museum has sparked discussions about repatriation and the importance of returning cultural artifacts to their rightful owners. The Gwegel Shield stands as a testament to the artistic prowess and enduring spirit of the Gwegel people, encapsulating a significant chapter in Australia's past. The Aachen drum is a musical instrument originating from West Africa, particularly among the Aachen people of Ghana and Ivory Coast. This drum holds deep cultural and historical significance within the Aachen society. Crafted with meticulous attention to detail, the Aachen drum showcases exceptional craftsmanship and artistic skill. Its distinctive hourglass shape, carved from a single piece of wood, captures the eye and imagination. The drum heads of the Aachen drum are made from animal skins stretched tightly over the wooden frame, producing resonant and vibrant sounds when struck. The rhythms produced by skilled drummers convey messages, announce important events, and reflect the rich cultural heritage of the Aachen people. The drum serves as a medium of communication, allowing communities to unite, express emotions, and evoke ancestral spirits during ceremonies and rituals. 
Beyond its musical function, the Aachen drum embodies the Aachen people's collective identity, cultural traditions, and spiritual beliefs. Its presence in social gatherings, festivals, and rites of passage is a testament to its enduring significance. Today, the Aachen drum has transcended its original cultural context and is celebrated as a symbol of African heritage and artistic excellence worldwide. The painted pebbles that were made in northern Scotland during the early medieval period reveal intriguing insights into the culture of that time. These small quartzite beach pebbles are adorned with dark brown designs, including dots, wavy lines, circles, pentacles, crescents, and triangles resembling Pictish symbol stone motifs. The dye used for painting remains unidentified, although peat tar is a likely possibility. Around 55 painted pebbles have been discovered so far, primarily at broke sites and locations connected to the Pictish era. These pebbles may have served as sling stones or charm stones believed to possess magical and healing properties. According to Scottish folklore, St. Columba blessed a white stone pebble from the river Ness, which had the power to cure illness when placed in water. This legend highlights the significance of stones with healing properties, a belief that still endures today, even in the developed world. The painted pebbles offer a tangible connection to ancient beliefs and traditions, providing valuable insights into the early medieval culture in Scotland. Their presence illuminates the cultural significance of these artifacts and their role in ancient practices. The Haniwa terracotta dancers housed in the Tokyo National Museum are a pair of intriguing terracotta burial figures from ancient Japan. These unique Haniwa, discovered in 1930 at the Nohara Burial Mounds in Saitama Prefecture, are renowned for their distinctive gestures, leading to their epithet as dancers. Dating back to the Kofun period of 250 to 538, these sculptures exhibit a simplistic design with abstract features and implied dancing motions. The Haniwa terracotta dancers are characterized by their high level of abstraction. Standing statues with clay stick arms, they lack the lower body, featuring a cylindrical tube as the base for the head. The figures hold their left arm raised and the right arm extended diagonally downward, forming an inverted S shape. Their expressive facial features with hollowed circles for eyes and mouths are uncommon for Haniwa. The smaller figure depicts a male farmer identified by a peasant hairstyle and a tool resembling a sickle, while the larger figure lacks hair and earlobes. Recent reinterpretations suggest that these Haniwa may represent horse keepers rather than dancers, but this historical theory is yet to gain mainstream support. A battlefield is a good place to go looking for buried treasure, but the problem with doing so is that most of the world's major ancient battlefields have already been identified and excavated. That isn't always the case, though. A Ming-era battlefield from around 370 years ago was found in China in early 2017, and so far it's already given up more than 10,000 items. Experts are still rooting through the things they found, but they're already very excited by this incredibly rare golden imperial seal. They think it may have been owned by the heir apparent of one of China's ancient emperors. The object comes from the Jiankao Chenyan historical site and dates back to the turbulent time in Chinese history as the Ming dynasty fell and the Qing dynasty rose. It's doubtful that anything found there during the rest of the search will be more valuable than the seal. The 3 by one inch golden rectangle with only its decorative tortoise is almost certainly the only one of its kind ever created. It may have even fallen into the hands of Zhang Xianzong, the rebel leader known as the Yellow Tiger who led the uprising against the Ming Empire. Long before people learned to play and loved the game of chess, they played a Viking-inspired game called Nefetafel, or games based on it. While nobody knows the precise rules of this ancient board game, evidence of its popularity exists all over Europe. Here's a particularly striking Nefetafel piece that was found on the English island of Lindisfarne in July 2020. There was once a large medieval monastery on the island, but the monastery was stormed and occupied by Viking raiders in the year 793 during the first stages of the Viking invasion of Britain. They presumably brought their favorite board games along with them. 
As the piece is made of a heavily decorated piece of blue glass, it's likely that this was the king piece, of which the game had only one. We know the game eventually spread to the rest of Britain because pieces made from either bone or wood have been found at a variety of locations, but glass pieces are extremely rare. In fact, this is only the second example of a glass nephitophel piece ever to be found there. To say that the Cascajal block is a bone of contention for archaeologists and scientists would be to put things mildly. To its supporters, it's evidence that the Olmec civilization divides the first form of writing in the Americas. To its detractors, it's a more modern forgery, and there's little chance that the two sides will ever agree. The circumstances of its discovery don't help. Rather than being dug up by archaeologists, it was found in a pile of debris in Veracruz, Mexico by road builders in 1990. The clay figurines and ceramics found around it have been dated to around 1000 BCE, so it's assumed that the Cascajal block, with its complex system of glyphs, is from the same historical era. If so, it would predate the written language of the Zapotec by around 400 years. Some of the symbols appear to represent animals and birds, but others are abstract and impossible to decode. The arrangement of the symbols in haphazard rows is inconsistent with other Mesoamerican systems of writing, so it may be that each symbol is an independent piece of information. The repetition of certain symbols, though, might indicate a repeated letter or word. Maybe one day we'll decode it. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you'll be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching.